Hello and welcome to another episode of the Destiny Truthcast. This is episode 65, kind of, and 66 in reality. We can get to that in a moment, but uh, happy to be joined as always by my co-host, Redwing Girl. How are you doing today, Redwing Girl? I'm doing good. How are you doing, Souls? I am doing well. It's been a bit of an adventure uh, today. My internet is out, so I'm having to use my phone as a hotspot to be able to do this. So that's uh, taken quite a bit of my time trying to figure out how to set this all up this morning. We we seem to have uh, not the best luck the last uh, couple times we've tried to do this. Yeah, hopefully your battery doesn't run out. Oh, yeah, I'm sitting with it charged and plugged in, so hopefully uh, everything last to the end and uh yeah so for those that don't know we actually did a, another episode oh, about a little over a month ago and we had matt mylan games on and the file got corrupted and we lost the entire episode so that was kind of tragic but we are back today and we have a, another guest with us riley hot sauce um i'm sure a lot of people in the community are familiar with you how are you doing today riley I'm doing quite well. Thanks for thanks for having me on, Souls and Red Wing. This is a uh, this is a uh, this is going to be a good time. We're happy to have you. And if you could, just for those that don't know you, let the uh, community know a little bit about yourself, kind of what you do, and also what you do within the Destiny community. My name is Riley Hot Sauce. I am a variety streamer with a heavy concentration on Destiny. You know, Destiny is what brought me into Twitch and uh, showed me all these incredible friends around me all around the world. And so uh, you'll find me on Twitch. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, and that's how you'll know when I go live. And you also uh, work in film? Uh, yeah, I work in uh, local distribution and uh, PR. Um, I've worked for the local film festivals, doing guest relations and uh, public relations. And then on top of that, I uh, tell the little, small, little locally owned movie theaters what to play. Like your little three screen in the middle of nowhere, Washington. I tell it, uh, hey, you're going to be playing Deadpool and you're going to be playing it for this many weeks and this is how much you're paying. So that's what I get up to in my, in my other time. That's kind of funny. <laughs> You're going to be playing Deadpool. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, the little little guys out in the middle of um, you know, out in the middle of Idaho or, you know, they uh they can't be uh they can't be talking to Fox every week or Disney and say, "Hey, this is what I want." So, uh, that's me. So you stream on Twitch or do you stream on Mixer or YouTube or Facebook or any of the other ones or it's just strictly Twitch? So it's Twitch, and then um, I, have, I have forayed into Instagram Live every once in a while, you know, just to try out the try out the platform, because I'm um, I'm on Instagram a lot as well. So how many followers do you have uh, on Instagram? That's a great question. Eight hundred something. So what do you? So what are your hours? Do you usually just do morning or afternoon, or how, what time do you usually stream? Yeah, so since I um since it is a normal uh, sort of nine to five job, um I do end up streaming uh in you know pa a little like past seven p.m. I'm I'm on the late shift, you know I'm on the night shift. You'll find yeah. me in a you'll find me in a lot of chat rooms though, you know throughout the day. I'm I'm at an office job, and while I am diligently doing all of my work, you you might find me popping into uh, some Destiny streams or some Fortnite streams, saying hi to friends. And you also uh, do some podcasting yourself as well. Oh wow, you guys are you guys are fully in it. You, you've got all the you've got all the downloads. But um yeah, I uh snaps uh, she snaps mind of snaps on Twitter and uh Instagram and everything. We started a little uh it was like a little brainchild of hers. It's called High History Puff Puff Past where we um toke up a little bit and then just try and explain things. <laughs> All the things of life you try to answer. <laughs> yeah, you know, we'll start with like, okay, let's talk about, you know, Cinco de Mayo. And then, you know, suddenly we're talking about Jeff Goldblum. Or, you know, we're talking about video games. And let me tell you, it, it always comes back to Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> yeah, I, there was, I don't remember exactly what I was somehow, she snaps got into my timeline somehow on Twitter. And, um... She had this big exercise sort of program outlined and she did this huge like sort of Excel spreadsheet about, you know, your daily processes and everything. And, and it was really thorough. And I mean, I thought, man, this chick is she is like going for it. And and, and I after that started to follow her and she's you know, she seems like she's um, 
really positive and does a lot of, um, I don't really know what the word is, but she seems like she's just a positive person. She tries to, you know, kind of lay bare her soul and sort of just says it how it is. And I kind of like that, you know, there's not a lot of, you see a lot of streamers who are sort of fake and, you know, I don't know. I, I guess I have my own experience with some streamers. Some streamers I just don't think are very genuine. And I don't know if they need to be, you know. But she does seem like she's uh, she's the real deal. I think she's really good. She's great. Yeah, she is the real deal. She's uh, Mindfulness, I feel like, is a good word. Like, she's very mindful. She's very positive and mindful. She's thinking about how she's interacting with other people and how she can, you know, elevate other people. It's been so interesting sort of post um post the D2 drop watching all of these Destiny content creators sort of shift or change whether it be switching to Fortnite or, you know, doubling down on Destiny or diversifying outside of it but still keeping Destiny their home. And um her change over, you know, the past year has definitely been one of the most interesting to to watch but yeah she's uh she keeps it real and that's what attracted me to her as well yeah i uh i wasn't really familiar with you know i I was familiar with her but not like her content and then leading up to the summit i tried to get into as many of the other uh content creators um streams and watching youtube and just just learning about the people that were going to be there smart and yeah, and it was really um, a revelation to see what she is doing with her channel, with the um, kind of like uh, along the lines of the Saint Fourteen Project, um, another group that is all about the positive mental approach to life and and uh, mental health and well being. Uh, she had a stream dealing with abuse and and things like that not too long ago, and and it's cool to see being brought up within the community and within society in general, you know, today to, to, to see these things acknowledged and that people do Mm. have issues they go through and that Mm -hmm. there are others that, that experience these same thing. Can relate. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah. And, and uh, that's the thing is we'll be shooting the shit. Sometimes we're just, we're just, um, you know, having a good laugh just, and then some days, uh, you know, some days it's time to talk about mental health. Some days it's time to get healthy, you know? There's a, there's a, a, a rich dichotomy to, uh, to the content she's putting out. It's, it's great. It's great. So are you a uh, day one Destiny player? I am indeed. I am indeed. You know, Bungie's a local company for me, um, so I'd always sort of uh, been aware of them. And as uh, Destiny was, uh, as it was coming out, oh, I, I get giddy just thinking about it. Oh my gosh. Um, I remember the first day that it came out, I didn't, um, I didn't go out and buy a copy of Destiny. What I did is I went to Redbox. And at the time, Redbox was, you know, doing a video. I mean, I'm sure Redbox is still doing it. I just haven't been to Redbox in a couple of years. But they had, um, you know, a, a PS3 copy of Destiny. And I picked it up and I took it home and uh, played, you know, day one. And uh, I never gave that, uh, I never gave that disc back to Redbox. After about, I don't know, a month, they'll charge you. But um, I couldn't. I couldn't give it back. I held on to it, and I haven't let go yet. So the question is: Is what do you main? <gasps> That's okay. the The answer is: I main a hunter. Day one, I was a warlock, and I can't really, truly ever let go of my like warlock past. You know? Yeah, I know a lot of people that are really just like. You know, they prefer whichever class, and they they just always kind of fall back on the same kind of class. Um, mm-hmm. My my uh, friends are also hunters, and they just say hunters, master race, and all this other crap. Um, I'm a titan, and I'm always I've just always been the titan. Like I just feel like the titan is is the the best of the three. Although I do know that there are both other characters have good strengths and and weaknesses. And one of the things that I haven't really played a lot of PvP lately, um, and since they they came out with the triumphs yesterday, I did um, the legend, reach legend for the triumph because I hadn't even reached level one yet. 
Oh, yeah. And uh, I did it all in one day. It got to Legend. And you really see in Mayhem how different the classes interact and how useful and useless some of these supers are on some of these classes. And, man, the Titan Solar is just destructive in a sea of hunter tethers. I mean, I just love mm. it. Yeah, I bet. See, that's that's what was happening to me is when I was playing um, Mayhem, it's just a bunch of tethers. You're going around a corner and it's like, well, you're out of your super. To the Yeah, that's so... Oh, that's so true. I haven't uh, looked at it that way, but oh, the Titans are just running about. They're getting it done. Well, it, the I mean, I ran my all three of my characters through to get to the Legend, and I did... I was one of those. I was the tether hunter with the colony, and it's almost like murder. I mean, you can literally <laughs> just go in and keep tethering and tethering and shooting off your colony yep. over and over and over. Yep. And these poor people, you know they're throwing their controllers. <laughs> <laughs> so true. I've never really cared. I just do what I'm going to do and figure out a way to not step in their garbage. I'll get in a groove, and I'll be all about the warlock for a month then i'll be all about my hunter for a month and so i've really for the first time been all about the titan in d2 like for the last couple weeks um because i went back to striker because i hadn't really played the striker in in d2 and it's been really fun and mayhem the lightning grenades because everything was all about the pulse grenades and i pulled the lightning grenades back out and it really brought that class back for me just just what you can do with a perfectly placed uh lightning grenade people don't know is behind them and just watching them go flying it's a it's a very satisfying feeling i do enjoy seeing what ha you know has happened to the titan just you know in the shift from d1 to d2 there's d you know uh, making some of the supers a bit more roving like it's it's made it more mobile a bit more of a like a it's still kind of tanky but like a power you're moving through you're moving through you're you're getting around whereas um you know back in the day to be a striker titan you uh, you had to either be lucky or you know know the map like the back of your hand yeah this is true but unfortunately for me on the titan is what i always thought was the strongest of all three um, classes and that was the bubble. I mean, you could do a bubble with a St. Helm and you could totally take out teams. They would be dumb enough to walk into it, get blinded and then shotgunned. And those days are kind of over and I kind of feel bad about that class because it was really the class that you depended on to get through raids and, you know, to do, um, some really cool things in PvP. You know, everybody knows about the golden gun bubble strat. And, mm -hmm. you know, you just can't mm -hmm. really do that kind of stuff anymore with the Titan. You know, it's, you really have to do either the the hammers or the striker. And, and both of them are effective. Um, but, you know, with the mayhem going on, it, it, it sort of does diminish the whole point of mayhem with the Hunter's, you know, void stuff. I mean, it really just kills... Uh, mayhem in my opinion especially in the close maps where you can't really get out of it you know you're like in the room and you can't get out and so you have to kind of deal with it yeah that's uh that's actually pretty interesting because even with mayhem in uh, d1 when you think about it those those bubbles would sort of it was like a little bit of a respite you know people would uh kind of chill out for a second as you start approaching the bubble because they want you to walk right in so it would slow it down just a little bit even if it was you know incremental it was still an interesting change, and it, it, the ability is still there to use the bubble, but it's just not as, uh, it's not the same. That's very true. It's not the same. It's not that defense class that you're looking for. I wonder if we'll see that with the new Titan subclass that's coming, uh, because that's the, I think that's the only one they haven't revealed, or did they end up revealing all of them? Because I haven't heard that one anything I haven't, said about. Yeah, I haven't seen anything on that one. Yeah, I'm excited. It's time for some new supers. I haven't seen any of the footage on anything that Bungie's revealed on the new Destiny Forsaken. I haven't even watched the film on it. I haven't really watched, read any of the notes on it because I kind of want to be surprised because I just feel like this game has offered up so much and people know so much about it that I kind of want to just go into it blind. I totally respect that. Yeah, I, I, I get that. You know, trailer culture these days, whether it's movies, whether it's video games, they, they take, you know, 30 seconds or 60 seconds and they just like 
crack it open. They look at every little frame. They try and tell you, you know, what everything is happening. Where, you know, trailers used to be, you would see it once in the movie theater, and then you turn to your friend and you say, I want to go see that. And, like, that's it. You, you don't see that trailer again. But now it's, you know, it's cracked open and just so sort of uh, watered down. I, I, try to, I try to look at a trailer once get excited and then I don't I don't go back and keep watching it over and over and over again. Yeah, but I mean like they've completely ruined Cade's death. Like I don't know what's happened. So many feelings but, there, yep. I don't I like, don't know what, how why? Why I don't know. would they have already done that? It feels so weird the way it's handled and like I, I you know I, I watched, you know, the one time that some of the devs were talking and it's like it brings, you know, uh, it brings like intensity or it brings reason or like I don't know, a necessity to the plot point. And I'm like, this sounds like fridging in comic books where you just like kill someone to kill them because it, you don't know what to do with them. And it kind of, it makes you mad. It makes you upset. And I was like, wow, I hope this gets handled well. It seems like one of those things that if, if that would have happened, you know, if they wouldn't have given us that information in the day the game dropped, I mean, just, it seems like something that, Man, when you played through and all of a sudden that went down, the could, impact could you imagine? Could, have, could have had. Oh, just just really thinking about people's reactions to that would have been incredible. That would have been like a viral moment. It would have been a little upsetting for the people who hadn't gotten the DLC yet or hadn't played it because it would be all over. But that would have been an incredible moment to have hidden there. Even if it was in, you know, just the first, uh, the first um, you know, cinematic for the for the for the expansion that would be incredible but alas we know where we're heading we just got to reconcile our feelings on it now yeah i just don't get it <laughs> i'll never understand it i i mean it's it's just Post takes up. such a huge thing out of out of the desire to find out what's actually going to happen in in you know forsaken but it is what it is like you said and we'll just know it's coming up at any moment <laughs> Well, the other thing I kind of didn't like is that people are playing parts of the opening mission, kind of like we did at the uh, at the reveal event, but that's getting out there, you know, that, oh, it, it goes down a little differently and stuff, and I don't, you know, I don't want to know. So as soon as I hear anyone talking about that, I just tune it out and shut it off. It's interesting, because when you look big picture, too, um, you know, Nathan Fillion being the voice actor, if you you know breaking the fourth wall for a second, it's interesting seeing who are probably some of the most uh, uh, some of the bigger the the most expensive actors that they've had on uh, you know d lending their voices to this game. You had um, you know Dinklebot, and he's gone. Then there was Nathan Fillion, now he's gone. Those are probably two of their you know most expensive guys. That's what it was, guys. It was all it was <laughs> it was all about the money. They needed Philly and out of there. He was asking for too much. Yeah, but you know, like they had an opportunity to kill off those characters at the at the uh, end of this story. You know, all three of them were practically dead on the ground when you got in before you fought Gaul. You know, I don't understand if they really wanted to end. You know that whole sort of you know, group of people and introduce new people like they did with Hawthorne and they can continue that on. They should have, they could have just killed them there. It would have made sense. Um, yeah. But this sort of kind of jaggedy, well, Kay's going to die in the next DLC just seems really out of place to me. But, you know, I guess they know what they're doing. Kay's dying. See you in four months. You're like, oh, oh, oh okay. See, see you then. So what kind of game... Are mostly do you play on the PvE side or PvP or are you just sort of down the middle both? You know, back in the day when um, when I was uh, playing, you know, it was just Warlock and me. Um, I was definitely a really, I was a PvP player. And this was before I found Twitch. You know, this is 2014, 2015. I would just play the story missions and then strictly PvP. Um, or, you know, I don't know what brought me to it. It must have been a friend mentioning Twitch or something. Um, when I went on and saw the like the incredible community that is there for like destiny it, you know and at that time it was so different than so many other communities on twitch um i was like i'm sorry what's a raid wait hold on N um yeah nightfall i've never i've seen that but i've never done it does someone want to like you know jump into a group with me and um that's when i started having my most fun was doing pve with friends um uh, you know the the big memories aren't me go you know 
getting going flawless or whatever uh, when i went flawless it was just like sort of stressful by the end i was like okay bye guys but you know doing a raid or golgi's challenge or things like that that's where i had uh, great memories doing pve with friends so what do you think about the raids in d2 so i did the first raid i haven't done um either of the oh gosh what's the term uh raid layers raid layer um because my my sort of base, my friend group has uh, moved on a bit. I've moved on in the sense that I'm playing mostly on PC now. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, other than that, I was already split because I would play, uh, I'd play PS4 and I'd be my Hunter and my Warlock over there. I'd play Titan on my Xbox. So I was already like splitting my friend group and, it, you know, it, I would struggle sometimes. But now I, I just don't, I don't have anyone. I'm trying to make, uh, I'm trying to make new PC friends to get it going again. But I uh, haven't, haven't done any of the uh, raid layers. The, my thoughts on the, um, the, uh, the first uh, raid, my gosh, there's a lot. It was a while ago, now that I think about it. It was, it was quite some time ago that I did my last uh, raid run. But um, honestly, I think it, it, um, it fell in line with the, with the um, not the DLC, but sort of the original game, the, the original storyline so well. Um, and uh, I, I like the... Uh, I like the overarching idea of like you know the the shiny exterior and then the the gritty underside of you know what's actually there. See, I didn't get that at all. I don't know what Gull and you know Callus have in common. Like it sort of has nothing to do with you know like with Oryx. We actually knew who all of his kids were, and he killed the queen, and you know there was storylines, and it was leading up to all of that. You know, Vault of Glass, all of that. There was, like, meaning behind most of it. But with with Callus, I don't see where he fits into the Gaul story at all. That is that is very true. There are some times where, where the raids were, you know, just really touching the storyline. They were really uh, right there. And it was a continuation of story missions. And this one did feel rather separated, plot-wise. And I mean... Well, I, I, I'm not I'm not a lore master or anything, but Gaul overthrew him, and there was there was a there was a schism there. Yeah, goodness, I haven't really thought about that. It doesn't it doesn't match up as well. well I think the the issue was they put there was a lot of the lore there for him, but it was all in um, the booklet that went out with like the collector's edition, told all his story, and then in the game there was one adventure but it was optional and to this day i I still never run it uh then introduced it because there's nothing that that pointed you there but i'm excited for forsaken because it seems like they're going back to that approach of the taken king and king's fall and and really tying it in um very much dreaming city you know to that whole realm's going to be not just the ray, but playable, like his like single player zone as well. Which was some of the coolest stuff they did in D one was when they allowed us to go in in missions into the Vault of Glass and story missions and go into there was one that let us go into Crota's End um, within the story, and and I think that's good because it allows players that don't raid to get into those zones at least and become familiar with them where maybe it's not so intimidating if they think they want to try to raid. I, I think it's a way to really bridge that gap and, and hopefully going forward get more people into that content. It is a good way of getting them in there. Yeah, I, I, do, I do like that. and um, We don't know much about the Dreaming City, but it sounds, it sounds like what we've been asking for. Yeah, all, a lot of the changes happening with Forsaken just seem really in line with what people have been saying since um d2 came out and and that's not being like you should have listened earlier it's like they've always been listening they're you know waiting for the right time to enact it you know not to not to like shade or anything but like you know if if there's a game in a beta you can change that you know at the drop of a hat with a you know fully fledged game like this with with uh, PvP and PvE so inexplicably tied together, you have to, you know, really make sure you're doing it at the right times. Test it. Make sure it's going to go well before releasing it and saying, "Hey, yeah, this is this is, you know, this is a full game. This isn't some little piecemeal that we'll keep giving you over the next couple of years." 
and I am just so excited to be um to to be here to be to be getting back into it. You know, when when that got released, there was that little bit of hype. Everyone sort of refocused again on Destiny or the grind, and um, you know, um, every once in a while they've given us something to continue it on, whether it be masterworks or things of that nature. It, it's going to carry us through, and I think Forsaken is going to really sort of reinvigorate the community. You're very optimistic. I would argue that I, I, most people thought that Destiny 2 was a tragic turn of events that lost much of the community, even to this day. True. And I'm not sure, you know, I, I, get, I get the excitement for Forsaken, Um and I, I, I'm also looking forward to it, but they've got a lot to live up to. And if some of the changes that they've made now is any indication of where we're headed, I, you know, for me personally, I, I'm not, I don't want those dramatic changes that a lot of people um, have been asking for. And so I don't know how they balance that or how they are going to... Um, address some of that, you know, going into Forsaken, but some of the changes that they've made now, I, I don't like, and I, and I have not been happy with, um, you know, this last few updates that they've made. So what are those changes that you're not uh, excited for or not interested in currently? Well, I really, really got burned out on the faction rally, um, getting to level 50, doing repetitive grinding, you know, an yep. event, you know, an event and then go into um, a lost sector repeatedly for hours and hours and hours and hours. And the only real way to actually rank up, you know, to get this catalyst. I just, I mean, I, I, I've never been so more, more burned out on destiny. And I've, I, I was beta. I played from the very beginning. Mm. I know what the grind is. I remember Sapphire Wire. I get it. I mean, I remember all that. But part of that was just busy work. And and the reason why they made changes in D1 to get rid of that busy work where you could buy those materials to actually rank up factions so that you had an opportunity to buy, you know, armor pieces and weapons and, and the other thing is because people didn't want to do that and they sort of went back to that and and you know and i just i just really got turned off i mean there's people that have done like 500 strikes that have never got a catalyst and that to me you know when when you completely do these things over and over and over and there's no reward then at some point you just walk away and say i've had enough i mean it's almost abusive yeah. But there's so many in the community that say, oh, yeah, you got to earn it. you got to earn it. Like, you know, you have to do that thousandth strike, and then you'll feel great about it. Well, I didn't feel that way when I got done with the factions. I mean, I, I felt completely wiped out, didn't want to have anything to do with it. And in the second faction, the first one I did the sun um, shot catalyst, so I did Future War Cult first, and then the second one I did Orbit because I really wanted the Graviton. And I approached it differently. Instead of doing it in one day, I did it throughout the week. But then I started to panic, like, by the fourth day, figuring if I don't really grind this out, I'm not going to be able to get it. So now I have two catalysts, and I haven't done one thing to actually get those catalysts completed because I'm so burned out from doing those factions. And I don't think that's why how people want this to be like do you really want to burn yourself out in order to get this gun that yeah it might be you know kind of cool to use but it's not the be all end all of weapons you know so i don't know i have i have really mixed feelings on it i if if forsaken is going to return to the, like the original vanilla destiny sort of grind everything i i just don't see long term how that's going to benefit that used to be what brought me back. I would, you know, put down Destiny and it would be the faction rallies or it would be specifically Iron Banner that would bring me back, that would make me want to, um, you know, grind. What was it that uh, uh, Spazzy called it? Level 30 Iron Banner. And it was all three characters on PS4 and Xbox um, to level five for Iron Banner. And I would do that and I would get burnt out, but not... Not where I'm just like distraught, where I just like throw the controller down and I'm like, I'm done. I'm done playing this game for a bit. It would just be, it, it would be rewarding by the end of it. And I totally understand that it, it, it doesn't feel 
there's not that reward by the end of it. Yeah. But the difference is, though, if you recall during those times, is that people complained that there was too many blue drops. And they changed it so that more people got legendary weapons or armor. And once they started to flood those rewards in, people started to see it as beneficial. You had an end game. You had to get to level five. If you wanted an armor piece, you knew you had a focus point. You had an end focus mm -hmm. point. With mm -hmm. strikes, it's like, you know, it's all random. You may never get anything. You may never get, you know, anything but blues and maybe an exotic, you know, engram, which you've already gotten anyway. I mean, they've pretty much made engrams or exotics sort of use useless now because i think everybody must have have must have all of the exotics by now i mean if you haven't then you have really bad rng but <laughs> i'm just talking about you know at least with iron banner you had the focus of 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 getting the opportunity to get a really good rolled weapon and some of the rolls on the armor and the weapons that they offered to buy if you hit the certain level were actually really good so you had a reason to grind that stuff out and it also elevated your light level which if you weren't doing raids at the time the focus was to actually take advantage of that so that you could get to the higher light levels none of that stuff really is about the game now now it's just you know you don't have to be, well, I know they're changing Iron Banner now. You have to be light level specific, you know, to have benefit, higher light level. But it's really just throw your tokens at the guy, hope you get the stuff, you know, whatever. And, and, and I just feel like all of that grinding is, has really just been pushed too hard. And there isn't really a carrot at the end of the stick anymore. And, and so I lose interest. Like I, of all of the moments of triumph thing that I, that I looked at on my uh, companion app, I only have 39 out of 50 of the strikes that I need for Vanguard. And that's because I hate strikes. I do my three strikes for my milestones and my nightfall on each character week, maybe but if I don't need it, because I'm already 385 on all three characters, I don't even do them anymore. So now I have to go back and do these strikes that I absolutely hate. And, and it's just because they've, they've just made it so unrewarding at the end of them that, you know, it just drives me away. So I'm strictly mostly a raid person. I love the raids. I do the raids all the time. Um, but, man, if, if Forsaken is going to be another extension of what we've already seen today i i just don't really i'm i'll be disappointed i'll i'll just put it that way well i think there's there's signs that though that it's going to change um the light level or power level going up to 600 i mean it's a going to be a huge uh increase and i think you can look at that and reasonably think that it'll entail a much smoother leveling process without the the things getting in the way my hope is that there aren't these caps you know where you can do this much for the week and then you're done that because it's going up so high you'll be able to as long as you're willing to run stuff you'll be able to keep progressing and leveling towards that cap um so i'm i'm very optimistic that we're going to see that there Going to the faction rallies, uh, something I don't understand is, you know, I I know that there's a need to give relevance to the lost sectors and, and whatnot, and there was a big call for that. But like you said, you're burnt out and doing it and just doing that repetitive thing over and over and over. I haven't done anything with faction rallies the last two. I haven't attempted it. I'm level 26 with Future War Cult just from playing raids, nightfalls, and whatever that we do, um, just playing the game. But something I've never understood is, you know, you, you talk about the strikes and the lack of meaning to them, which actually um, Dylan did uh, tweet out yesterday that they're going to start improving the uh, the drop rates on the catalyst for the strikes. The I think it was the strikes, didn't he say? The more times like you complete it, the better, where it doesn't No, drop, that's escalation. It. Oh, I, I thought it was escalation, escalation protocol. protocol. Okay, that's right. And people were asking for it to be for the, the strike catalyst too. That's what that was. Yeah, so they're doing that for escalation protocol. They need to do it for the strikes for the catalysts as well. You know, all that stuff like that, the, the longer you go without it dropping, the chances should go up. 
but going to the faction rallies, you know, why not give 20 tokens for a heroic strike completion and let so, let a player get a complete rank for running it? I mean, it's still, you'd have to run 50 strikes to to level up in a week. And I, I think that's fair, mm. you know, for the yeah. raids. You know, if you run a raid, give people 10 tokens per per uh boss chest open and then another 20 for a full clear you know i did the added it up and it came out to like it'd give you like 14 or 16 ranks if you did all your raids on on all three characters which isn't a lot when you have to get to 50 but you know it's it's something you know and it's more than like you get like what three tokens per chest now rwg something like that i don't know i think it should be a hundred a raid yeah, something. Make it make it meaningful, you know, and, and you know, if it shouldn't be the beat your head against the wall. And and they want Destiny to be the hobby game and it's not right now. There it's not a hobby when you can do X amount of things for a week and then you're done and you can't progress anymore. And like you said with the exotic engrams, you know, once you have them all if an exotic engram drops, it at least used to be something that had a chance to raise your light level, and now it doesn't even do that because it drops. Be- they drop a low level now, so you know. Uh, but I, I'm very hopeful that all that will change with Forsaken. I, I think Forsaken is going to be the best of what we saw in Destiny One and Destiny Two. That that is my hope for it, and you know, just big picture, I. I know why Destiny 2 ended up how it ended up, and I've still enjoyed it. I firmly believe it got too casual, but, you know, and Warmind got too too grind fest. But um, I think that they're really dialing in a lot of things at the studio, what the game really is, where they want it to go, what the community expects out of the game. And, and you see... From the top down, you know, the how they've changed things with how they operate and communication and everything else. And um, I don't know. I, I, I know there have been a lot of missteps and uh, a lot of bumps in the road. But I'm, I'm very hopeful that it gets back to uh, the game that you loved when we get there, RWG. Yeah, I mean, we'll see what happens with Forsaken. I mean, like I said previously, I mean... It's it's all on the line at this point. I mean, they they have to take everything that people talked about in D one that wanted you know changes and and of course you know everything that um, the summit and all of you guys discussed at the summit and they have to try to balance that. Um, but just some of the things that they changed in in this DLC is. I, I think a, a turn for the worse. So we'll see if if they can reverse that and sort of you know balance some things out. But you know I'm I'm optimistic, but I'm also um, you know we've got four or five years under our belt on how Bungie has treated Destiny. So I'm a little a little apprehensive to say I'm all in and I, and I think the studio has it now and it's going to be a great game. I I don't believe that that's going to be the end result. I still believe there's going to be things that people are just going to throw their hands up in the air and say, you know, what the hell? And then of course there's going to be other aspects where people are going to be like, this is great. What a great change. So you have to take the good with the bad, but we'll see how it balances out. So I'm, I'm sort of, you know, I'm, I'm sort of at the, edge of destiny where i i kind of have the feeling of i still like playing it it's it's still you know fun sometimes but unless they can really pull it out you know i'm i'm kind of at the stage where i need to like move on to other games so we'll see i feel that i feel that what have uh either of you what have your thoughts been on what you've seen released for the solstice event that's coming up and all the uh the gear that they've shown the ghost the bits of armor and whatnot i th- I think it looks uh pretty cool myself while i i'm grateful that they've they're giving us more stuff i'm just not sure what the benefit of, of any of it is i mean it's it's sort of the same stuff like here's your reward you and 
and I'm not knocking, you know, the, the artists at Bungie are incredible. The, some of the stuff that they do in this game is absolutely incredible. But it has to be a, an actual reward that benefits you, not just something that you're going to collect and put in the vault. That's true. I, I, I'm still one of, I'm one of the people who believes that, uh, you know, fashion is end game. Like at a certain point you, you got a bunch of armor pieces and you just start making your guy look good. Um, it's true that dude, I am too though. Really? (laughs) (laughs) It's a, it's a good time. It's a good time. Like by the end of it, you, you need something there. And yeah, I guess these pieces do kind of feel, um, thrown in, you, well, what else would we be grinding for? You know, as we increase light level, they got to give us something. Otherwise, it would really, it would really be pointless. So yeah, they might be um, these these pieces might be uh, cosmetic in nature, but uh, uh, I'm I'm ready for it. I'm ready for it. I love oof, you know since they since the raid um, shaders, I have loved this gold and white look. It's it's classy. It is it is eternal. It is like almost Renaissance, but it's like futuristic. It, it reminded me of the stuff. Reminded me of the um, Galahorn uh, Sparrow, whatever the Galahorn yes. or whatever. Yes, um, very reminiscent of that. I, I thought it, what I've seen looks really cool. And like one thing that I thought with D two it needed improvement is like the look of the gear a lot of i mean you look especially everything that's been said about titan the titan class and titan armor and the giant shoulders and whatnot and you know you had all this incredible stuff in d1 like the uh the stuff you could get from the speaker the titan marks and the cloaks and and the bonds were really cool and there hasn't really been anything in d2 that's kind of approached that level and I just thought that the stuff that what they showed from the solstice, it looked like it was getting back to uh, to that, and I, I I'm really excited for it. I'm excited for changes or to the uh, end power level going up to 400, going into Forsaken. I think that's cool. I know it's it's a it's an area of contention with a lot of people because the weapons are only available through rating. But for something that's going to be for five weeks, I don't I don't have an issue with it. And I think it's cool that it's going to give some kind of meaning to those prestige raids since they are ending up dropping so late in the life cycle of the game. So, so does the armor glow? Can you apply chroma to it and make it different colors, or is it just white? I don't think they've shown the the full sets. Uh, from what I saw, it was just like showing like half the helmets of each, like the the face yeah, the of the, the warlock the mm-hmm. titan and the hunter and they just showed like half of it so you were just getting a glimpse so i'm very interested to see what the full sets look like yeah getting those teases of the the uh the helmets what what i love is seeing the a little bit of the hunter cloak because that you know is a little more indicative of the whole outfit and i'm happy with it i'm happy with it so something else that's been a topic within the community and something that's been going on you know since destiny 2 launched is the kind of negative side of the community the negative side of gaming culture with the way people you know treat each other and what women gamers and streamers have to deal with on a daily basis as a streamer yourself riley i'm i'm sure that there's things that you deal with in chat um just people come in just to be ignorant um and we've got all the stuff that's happened the last few days with arena net and what they did there with firing the two writers because of the outrage campaign that to a large degree was bot accounts and alt accounts uh, bombarding them, which we saw on Bnet with the forums, uh, with the Eververse at the uh, start of the year where people were allowed to make accounts without any restrictions and the forums were just flooded with people making dozens and in some cases probably hundreds of alt accounts to spam and harass and attack start with you riley what's what's your thoughts on 
on what's been going on and, and just the culture of hate within gaming. Yeah, I mean, it's it's very interesting uh, seeing what um, a streamer and a community can do. You know, when you look at something like uh, Guardian Con, you know, this is an incredible thing put together by, you know, content creators for an incredible cause. And these people band together for something so good. And isn't that incredible? But yes, it does seem like what often uh, you see more is the outrage politics, the the one thing that people are upset about becoming the issue. Um, and it, it, it's interesting watching a, uh, a, a community sort of, you know, fa fall in line, listen to a figurehead or, you know, uh, not blindly follow, but make the decision to ignore a lot of other pieces of information as you just want to, you know, say what you want to say and get your words out because you think that, you know, what you have to say is more important than what they are saying or what they are doing even. But it's it, it's so interesting um, seeing the way that the the sort of, yeah, the, the arena net scandal, I guess you would call it, arena net gate, <laughs> seeing how it was, um, seeing how it was handled, mostly because I don't think, I don't think many people thought it was going to be, uh, uh, you know, flushing out that way. I don't think people thought that uh, the company wouldn't be in support of their own. When you whip someone up into a frenzy, it, it's interesting because uh, even on like Twitter, you'll sometimes you'll be seeing people complaining about people complaining, and you keep scrolling, and you don't actually see anyone complaining, but you see a lot of people complaining about complaining. And you're like, I don't even know what I'm supposed to be complaining about. Because uh, I don't see anyone doing it, and so it does seem like there's a, like uh, you know, more, more focus on the outrage, more focus on what, what is wrong than you know all the things that are right, and that's true in gaming, that's true in a lot of aspects of life. But it was, I wish that there would have been more support for. I'm trying to be careful with my words here. <laughs> I wish that. Goodness, how do I put this? Mansplaining comes from a place of wanting to help someone learn something, but it doesn't get executed correctly, and it's often just talking down, especially when you're talking down to someone who is in the know, who has more knowledge than you, who has the monopoly on it, who works for the company that you're talking about. And I don't know. It's messy. It's messy. I, I don't think I don't think um, streamers and their opinions should affect people's jobs. That's for sure. I think I think it, it just it seems like it went so far for goodness. I don't know. Things are going into retrograde, and it's just an interesting time with the planets. <laughs> well, I think part of the problem is is that we're dealing with a corporate culture which has, you know is motivated by retaining the dollar. And then so you true. have a culture where most people, and then, you know, you have the Me Too culture where people are just, you know, ultra sensitive to anything offensive and being politically correct and, and whatever. And those two are going to always clash. I don't know what the person said. I didn't read um all of the the tweets and the the back and forth between those two people i only heard that there was sort of a reddit um campaign against the woman from the start and i did read the the uh ceo's response and it, to it all and then the firings I mean, it could it could have been handled differently. It could have been handled better. I mean, she could have said he could have said, "I want you to apologize," or "I want you to make a statement," or "This is a warning," or whatever. But he felt so pressured by what he considers the consumer, and part of the the thing, especially with Bungie, I re if you guys remember how. Luke Smith, his response to 
um, Eververse was, you guys are going to throw money at the screen. The stuff we've made is so great, you're going to love it. His, in his mind, he felt like everything was going to be so great, people were just going to buy this shit up because we were going to love it so much. And there was people in the community that were repulsed that when you buy a game, you should get everything from that point forward free. And you shouldn't be paying for anything. So there was a complete clash between someone's own personal money, a uh, corporation's way to make money. And, and, and instead of Bungie firing Luke Smith and saying, how dare you offend you know, the, the gamer who doesn't want to spend more money on our stuff... He approached it differently and apologized if he came off flip it, which, you know, I thought was completely appropriate. And I do get the I do get the impression that a lot of people in the community, both um, streamers and content creators, and the average gamer that nobody knows, doesn't understand how games are made, what goes into it, what their you know limits are. And it's easy for someone to say, you know, be an armchair, you know, quarterback and say, you know, you should have done this, you should do that, whatever. But unless you understand because you are educated in that field and you completely understand the dynamics and the inner workings of what it is you're actually commenting on, you know, you have to sort of take that person with a grain of salt. I mean, we can go on these podcasts and complain all day long about how we don't like things or how we do like things. But unless we fully understand, you know, the process going into it, then we really are just talking in the wind. They can take our, our opinions and our feedback and see if there's some way that they can actually make them. But one of the things that I like about Bungie, and this goes to the core of their... Um, group as a whole is their rebelliousness, both when they worked with Microsoft and in the very beginning of their studio, is they just don't give a shit. And there are some people, there are some gaming companies like, um, oh, I forgot the name of the company that does that. Um, I think it's Rockstar. And they talk about grand, um, whatever that stupid game is. You know, they just don't give a shit, and they do what they want. It's their game. Of course they want people to like it and play it and do whatever, but they're going to do it because these are the visions that they have, and at some point, you have to let the creator create. And I just, I feel like, you know, the, the bashing of the creator cons constantly is just going to push them away and they're not going to provide the transparency or the education for those people that don't understand to let them know these are how things work and this is how you know how we do it and this is why we do it bungie's been sort of better at sort of saying well this is why we can't do it these are our limits these are why we things you know, we think things will work better. And this goes to the P2P thing, dedicated servers, you know, how, how we could only have a certain amount of people in our, in our, um, patrol areas or how they wanted 4v4 and PVP. I mean, they've, they've gone to some length to sort of explain their process and their thinking on it. And some people either accept it or they don't. The ones that don't, probably never would anyway. And then there's just the basic troll. I mean, there are people on YouTube that record parties that they go into and harass people. And the one thing that you had posted earlier, Souls, about that uh, woman streamer who was, who was talking with this guy who was just totally trash talking. I mean, you can't, you can't fix bullies. Bullies are everywhere. They've been everywhere. You can't, I mean, you, you just can't stop it. Microsoft has done panels with women on how to address the game culture, you know, with women. And, you know, there's been Gamergate. It, it has been addressed. It's been highlighted. And it's not going to change a grown-ass man who feels like he can create nine random accounts and go in and bitch somebody out because it makes him feel better. I don't know how you can address that as a community. It's it's just some people are assholes. And it's just you can't change it. But for companies, I think that they have to support their 
their their developers and their con and their creators and and give them a sense of assurance that if they feel threatened in any way that they're protected that they're supported and um you know that they're important to the company but they also have to you know let that person know that if they're in that position they have to walk away they can't they can't just be competitive and and you know if you're famous and you own the company i guess you can do whatever you want but you can't just be flip it to everybody i mean at some point you whether you're representing the company or not you're still working for that company and you're still engaging with that consumer and it's sort of a fine line and i and i give i give these developers a lot of credit i don't know how they can put up with it i would be offended a lot it would bother me a lot and i probably wouldn't interact and and at least with bungie despite all of the vicious and i mean vicious things that they've said and threatened their lives and have said the most unbelievable things and people that we know that talk behind their back and even say oh we love bungie but when you see some of their you know behind the scenes talk they trash talk bungie all the time and bungie still comes to them and holds out their hand as an olive branch and said please come back and, and let's talk about how we can make you like our game i mean that's a big thing for anybody in any kind of um i mean you don't see that with like uh you know craft macaroni and cheese i mean craft isn't going up there saying how can we make our cheese better for you know nobody's calling you know the the mortgage companies of the united states saying you know when are, wh how can we make your payment plans better i mean it's such a unique kind of um, give and take between a gamer and, and the game maker that I don't, it's, it's, it's a unique experience and I don't know how, um, I don't know, honestly, I don't know how many of them do it. And I give them credit for even interacting with the community because I think a lot of the community is very hostile to them and, and purposely slow. I mean, we saw a campaign on Bnet and the sole purpose, the number one purpose was to take down Bungie, to put them out of business, regardless of anything that they would have ever done. If they would have put them to bed at night and f spoon fed them everything that they wanted, they still would have, pro uh, still would have tried to proceed to take down Bungie. And, and that's the kind of, um, people that you're dealing with a lot, especially in Reddit and some of these like off shoot, whatever forums. I mean, these people are just hell bent on destruction. And I don't know if you can ever fix that. So the people that are, you know, out there putting themselves out there as content creators, I mean, you just have to, you have to protect yourself. You have to, you have to be able to, um, you know, mute these people, not give these people a platform. Don't let them take over your channel. Don't let them talk. Don't let them, don't give them their five minutes. Just push them out of the way, move forward for the people that actually like you, listen to you and want, want to be a part of your life. And that's the only way it's ever going to be, you know, palatable in my opinion. I just don't see how you can ever fix the bullying that happens in gaming. And I've had my fair share of it. Believe me, I know a lot of what these, these women do and some women just can't handle it. And I, and I understand that too. And so I, I give credit for, you know, content creators that have to put up with this shit. And I give credit to the developers and, and gaming companies that put up with this shit. And, and I do know because I have watched them, you know, I don't know what PlayStation has done about it, but I've seen Microsoft hold panels on it. They've talked about it. They've tried to, to find ways to bring, um, you know, women to the forefront to discuss about how things would be better for them and, and, and be inclusive. So, you know, I'm sure things can get better, but I'm not sure how you get rid of the worst. Well, I think a big part of it is not empowering them to begin with and also just acknowledging that it exists i mean acknowledging you know for a platform like twitch they, they need to acknowledge that they have a problem with the fact that people can get on and create an infinite number of accounts to just bombard a, a streamer and harass them and 
knock them off their stream. True Vanguard um, tweeted out, I think it was two days ago, that he got knocked offline um, by people attacking his stream. And he put out there, you know, this is how he keeps a roof over his family's heads. You know, this is his living. And people are out there trying to take that away from him. You know, you saw the 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 video that um, Miss Noodle posted that you referenced and the attacks that she gets on a daily and weekly basis, just carrying people through trial streams, like not paid carries, just trying to help people through that have never done trials before and give them a chance to hopefully get to the lighthouse. And people go in and, you know, you saw the, the disgusting comments there. And, you know, you look at the arena net uh stuff that went down and again you know it's the fact that people can go and create all these bot accounts you know alt accounts that are just there just to inflate numbers and make it look like there's this big outcry that's not but the problem is is it it does grow the hatred because there's people out there that don't know better and they see, oh man, this person posted this and they've got 500 likes or a thousand likes. Even though those thousand likes are, you know, just phony accounts, they see that and think, oh, well, if I do that, I can have the same reaction. And it becomes this, I'm important because I'm posting this bullshit and I'm attacking and I'm championing the gaming industry. I'm going to be a champion of the gaming industry and I'm going to put Bungie out of business because they don't represent what the gaming industry should be. Or I'm going to get the arena net fired because they don't represent what, what the gaming industry should be. And there has to be a way to combat that because it's, it's not just gaming. Look at, all the fucking Make America Great accounts posting all their fucking bullshit that's destroying this country and supporting this fucker in office. And you go to all their accounts and it's the same fucking thing. MAGA, you know, I'm in Texas, MAGA, Make America Great, oh, God bless America. You know, fuck you. You're a fake account. You've got three followers and no one following you. But they can do this shit perpetually, you know, and and there's nothing stopping it. And it's a problem. And so that's step number one, is that... Well, in, uh, wait a minute. Be, hang on, hang on, hang on. I I hear what you're saying, and I think that you're right. The Facebook has addressed it. I think Facebook is aware of it, and I think Facebook is trying to deal with it, and I'm sure Twitter is in the same boat. They deleted, like, you know, Twitter hundreds of care. thousands of... That's not true. Twitter created hundreds of thousands or deleted hundreds of thousands of accounts um, that were deemed fake. I mean, it, 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 but what, I mean, it's obvious that you can't control someone who can create accounts over and over and over again. And if you advocate for that, what if I wanted to create like 10 accounts and use them for different things? And they said, no, you're only allowed to create five accounts. Well, that's bullshit. So, what you're asking for is like this broad department of somebody's that's going to go in and look at and see how you use every single account. And I, I think that's impossible. Yeah. When you look at, I mean, when you look at whether it's uh, like the, the game company and the consumer, like the game company and the consumer or the content creator and the consumer, or even, you know, one of these companies like Facebook, Twitter, and the consumer of it, it always seems to be almost like a sliding scale in between, um, supporting yourself and defending yourself and uh, supporting or championing your consumer. And with game companies, you'll see it go back and forth. You know, sometimes it's like, well, we're going to protect our own. Like, we don't care about that opinion of yours. Like, it's not there. And then sometimes, you know, there's the other side of the scale where it seems like in the arena that um, situation, the consumer did tip the scale and uh, arena net sort of not bowed, but uh, listened in a way that might be good for them in the long run. It might not be, but yeah, it's interesting when, when, you, when you hear about these people who, what they want, their purpose is trying to 
shame a company or you know get something removed or like wh- when would you ever when would you ever get to share that you're like oh yeah i got you know like i got someone fired from a company like hire me like what that's not in no universe is that a good thing in no universe are people like you have you know you have done something good for the you know, the gaming community like come on right on in here that sliding scale it, it's got to be you know like I think Bungie's done a good job of sort of playing the middle ground. They, you know, they protect their own and they, you know, they they hold things close to the chest, but they're also there for the consumer. I mean, uh, I, I do remember when Twitter did that, uh, that purge of all those accounts and there was a big outcry from, you know, the right because they said, you're getting rid of my followers. And Twitter was like, well, we got rid of a bunch of bots. So if your followers were bots, like, <laughs> that's not on us, really. And there's always, you know, the cry of like um, uh, freedom of speech or things of that nature. But if you're talking on, you know, if you're on Reddit, if you are on a forum, if you are on Twitter, you don't have the right to say whatever you want. No, you just can't get arrested for saying stuff. People can still tell you your opinion is shit. People can still delete your comment if you want to. And, um, you know, I guess that's they try to get around that by creating all these accounts and trying to make their voice be the thing that's heard. They, yeah, I guess at the end of the day, it's just them wanting to get heard, but hopefully you, you, what you want is the voices being heard to be the ones that are changing things in a good way. You know, like a a female game dev talking about the issues of her career. That's the, that's the voice you want heard. Not necessarily someone who's like, well, actually you're wrong, but also I'm agreeing with you. And you're like, bro, like what's happening here? It's just, it's always going to be that, that, you know, that sliding scale between you or, you know, what you're creating and the people around you. And do you listen to their opinion where it can be helpful sometimes? Or, you know, like I've heard many creative types say, if you're creating anything, you don't want to listen to opinions. But at a certain point, you gotta, you know, when it becomes broad enough, when it becomes wide enough, when there's enough interest, you got to start listening to others' opinions. And it's rough, but it's an important part of development of you know especially something so ongoing as video games or you know apps social media sites listening to the people using it is integral to creating to continue to create you know what you've what you've started yeah and i mean a lot of the destiny videos that are on youtube the ones that get the most likes are the ones where these people are just shitting all over the game you know they they just like oh my god this game is dead and blah 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 and you know they just keep repeating the same stuff over and over and over and you know if that's what their followers want to to see that's you know whatever you know like like i i I feel sort of indifferent to it like if you don't like something and you're gonna you're gonna go to try to find somebody that agrees with that and if a lot of people agree with that then of course you're going to get a big following i don't agree with you know grown ass men going into a party and bitching out somebody. I mean, I just think that's just that's just being a bully and there's tools to avoid that interaction and it's just mute. You know, you just don't kick them out. You don't need to listen to it. You don't need to expose your listeners to it. And, you know, I I wouldn't even engage in it. And I have engaged in it. Now I just don't even deal with it. I mean, I get messages all the time. But who cares? You know, you're just a you're somebody why why should i care about what you think you're nobody you're no i don't know you you don't know Mm -hmm. me you're just being Mm -hmm. a little bitch good for you you sent me a message hope you feel better great good you know this is this is yours this is not mine this doesn't have anything to do with me this is all about you bud like exactly feelings this doesn't affect yeah, it, it it is upsetting though, because by by the end of it, by the end of the day, like the proverbial day, you don't want to have to put it on the the person being attacked. You know, you don't like. Uh, I think it was Rain, uh, Rainbow Six. One of their devs, um, there was, they were talking about how they were going to start cracking down more on verbal abuse in um, in in game chat, and there was some people complaining, and the dev straight up was like, "If you can't get into, if you like." can't be in one of our game chats and not just be using like racial epithets or just 
freaking throwing out like hate speech, we definitely don't want you in our game. Like you're not the person we want there. You you can you're fine to move along. We don't care if you keep complaining about this. This is a good step. This is a step in the right direction. And it's it's refreshing to hear that because, you know, like it is the most effective way. It is the quickest way. The old like mute and move on. I I hope and pray for a day where people are good enough, you know, that you don't have to. But it's always there's always going to be those people who are who want to make you feel bad, who want to try and hurt you, for whatever reason. And sort of going off on I don't know what's called the D two effect, the sort of like this game is dead, blah 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 blah. How I experienced it was I you know D two launched. I'm playing the game. I'm enjoying it. I'm streaming it. It's a good time. I'm playing through the story mission. Now, the the people who are playing it 8, 10, 12, 16 hours a day, after three or four days, we're already like, whoa, I'm burnt out. I, you know, there's not enough to do here. Whereas I'm still leisure, not leisurely, still, you know, like pretty much grinding the game, but I'm still finding things to do, new things to do, new areas to explore. I continue on. And then... You know, these people who do, you know, make a living or, you know, their their gimmick is, you know, destiny isn't what it used to be. It feels like those are the people who used to be not on our side, but who used to be making those videos about D1, enjoying it. And, um, you know, a lot of people, I guess, heard everyone saying it's not enough. It's not what we wanted. It's not this. It's not that. It's not, 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 not. And they took that in and they're like, great. I want to watch those YouTube videos that talk about why it's not good enough without, I don't know. My, my opinion wasn't, it isn't enough because I was being satisfied, you know? Yeah. A couple months in, uh, it started to get a little stringy. I, I would wait for DLC releases, but I was still there. I was, I would play it. It would be my go-to, my home, where I went back to. And it was almost like these people were ready to say they didn't like it, like a week into it, and they knew that that was going to be good for them or good for their channel. And it was just, you see it in so many games, just being upset, being not happy with it, but still playing it, you know, 12 hours a day. And you're like, bro, like, I don't want to watch you play something that you don't like that you complain about all the time just because it gets you growth. Like, if you want growth, do it. But I, I, I don't want to be here for your, your semi-toxic growth. Well, it's kind of funny that you say that because, you know, like, when I used to pop, when I used to be on Bean Addict quite a bit, you know, it would just, it would be so funny. You could literally almost time it. You know, it was like talking points. So certain streamers would, you know, that hated Destiny would come out and say, you know, this gun, this particular gun has no, I mean, guns that, you know, people don't even really use anymore, right? This gun sucks now. We need this gun to be buffed. And then, like, all of a sudden, like, you'd see, like, 10 or 12, you know, posts go up about these random players saying, you know, I, I this gun needs to be buffed. You know, people haven't even used this gun in, like, over a year. And all of a sudden, you're seeing these, the, the demands for this specific exotic to be buffed. Like, out of nowhere. You know, it's like, either you have a mind of your own, and you're going to do what you like and play, or you're going to follow someone else who's going to lead you down a rabbit hole. Either whether it's a good one or a bad one. If people really like a game, they're going to play it. But for me, I just, I, I look at the complaints about, you know, D2. And for some reason, I see these rose-colored glasses of how great D1 was and how awesome it was to grind for all these things. And if I go back during that period and I can read every single post that I've read, people hated D1. People they hated, hated to write all this shit. And, the and Yeah. And so, like, now it's like all of the sudden people have forgotten, like, how much they, you know, hated that kind of, you know, mindless grind and now they're calling for it again. Like, I don't understand that. The whole Forever 29 isn't a made up word. And we're faced, and, and there's a lot of people now that will always be Forever 3, you know, 70 because they can't do the raid. It's the I same just did exact thing. 385 yesterday, finally, on my final character. And you've done and raids. I play the hell out of the game. <laughs> Right. So I just, I, you know, I, I don't want that whole, you know, mob mentality 
of people who follow a lot of people who still have that desire to of the D1. I just feel like it's like rose-colored glasses. I really do. I don't I I I can't put my finger on it, but I just don't understand it. That's a great way to put it, because that's totally what it is. Everyone is like, oh, D1 this, D1 that. And they're like, oh, maybe, you know, like, we'll return our gunplay back to, like, how it was in D1. And everyone is like, oh, my gosh. And I was like, do y'all remember the last year of PvP in D1? Like, everyone hated it. Everyone hated it. It was it was bad. And, yeah, it's, it's literally just wanting what you, you don't have, you know? Like there's something shiny and new in front of them, but they're like, well, change, I don't like change, I want to know, I want what I already had. And it's just, uh, yeah, it is It is really frustrating, I, especially, you know, some of these, like, Destiny people might not have played the first one, but they'll still parrot that. They'll still parrot that mentality that D1 was, like, the Alpha and the Omega, which, like, D1 means a lot to me, but by the end of it, like, all, it was just hearing about a lot of people's frustrations, you know, in so many different aspects. And I remember even the beta, like um, the beta for D2, how happy people were, how, you know, they would, sw after the beta, they had, had to switch back to D1 and they're like, oh no, like D2 is so fun, blah, blah, blah. Um, during PAX, PAX 2017, there was the whole D2 experience at the Paramount. And it was like, it was literally Christmas Eve because like all the gifts were out under the tree, but we hadn't opened anything and everyone was just happy. Everyone was happy about what's going to happen. But then Christmas came around and we opened it and you didn't get what you wanted and you're just complaining now. And you're like, eh, Christmas Eve was better. Well, maybe maybe it was, but you got something now, aren't you? Aren't you enjoying what you have? Yeah, it it goes back again to it's the the culture of of hate, the popularity of it. Hate sells. Um, people know that they'll get the the likes and the views, and you know that it makes them feel important. And to go back to, you know, just what can be done about it you know bullies are always like you said rwg a bully is always going to be a bully but i just think that it just needs to be acknowledged and addressed that that this stuff is going on that it is a problem and not just you know not talk about it and tell people just ignore it you know and and hope it goes away you know the the famous line on and Bungie, you know, just just mute. You know, even, well now the mute function works and it it's helped a lot. But you know the the damage the damage has been done with with what it was before. Um, you know, I mean, you look at look at what we've gone through with the podcast, and you know, this podcast started as a way to let everyday players on Bungie dot net come on be on a podcast, have their voices heard, and give their feedback uh, on this format to to Bungie, to the developers, to let other players in the community get to know them, hear the voices, you know, behind the gamer tags. And we'd post these up on Bnet, and what would happen in every post, every week that we posted it up, the garbage would rise to the top, you know? And and that's that's been a problem on Bnet you know, from the beginning is that the garbage rises to the top. It's not not stuff that people actually like that that gets seen and gets viewed. It's the, the stuff that gets talked it gets commented the most, which is always the shit talking. And every single post that we'd put up with the podcast would turn into a just a shit fest of just bullshit. And the top comments would just be just garbage attacks, garbage attacks. And yeah, there would be lots of awesome people in the threads and lots of people that loved it and good comments but when you click on it the first thing you read is just trash and it completely destroyed that experience you know and you know here we are and we, we we're doing our first podcast in uh, a month and a half and the first one that's actually going to go up in probably what two and a half three months you know because that experience, you know, is taken away. You know, I, I don't feel like I can go to Bnet and and say, hey, does someone from the community want to come on, just an everyday player, and and have this experience now and put them up there? 
because it just got shit on all over by them. And yet here you have a community that in the midst of all the Eververse and all this and, and post summit, well, we don't have a voice. It's only the streamers that have a voice. Well, we tried to do something on our own time. Just, you know, we didn't get anything out of it. You know, this is just something we do to try to give back to the community. And it, and it got completely shit on. But now you're complaining that you don't have a voice or a say in anything. You know, it's like... I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm a little bitter about that. So I'm going to throw that out there right now. But I don't know what you do, but you have to acknowledge there's a problem. And with Bungie, they finally acknowledge that, hey, we have a problem. We have all these... You know, people that are allowed to just go in and create as many accounts as they want. So they put in the qualifier that you have to at least gone to the farm. Did it clean out everything? No, but it did make it more players that actually have been in the game and played something that are posting. And that's a step. It's it's something in the right direction. They fixed their mute function. It's a step in the right direction. There can be more done. You know what that is. You know it's. It's not going to happen unless it gets talked about, you know, and with with Twitch and all the all the shit with the, the people that can create all the accounts there and just go in, you know, like you said, RWG, do you go to the point you can't where if you legitimately want to have five accounts or whatever for different things to prevent you from doing it? Well, no, you don't want to do that. But unless the stuff is discussed, you know, then no one will ever figure out what the answers are. And at this point, it's just not discussed. No one talks about it. They just, everyone just hopes it goes away. And, you know, the ugly little, you know, underside isn't just an ugly little underside anymore that can be swept under the rug. I mean, it's it's coming to the forefront. We saw, um, you know, not just these firings, you know, we've dealt with, with threats of swatting. From, from this podcast, you know, where we get, you know, a few hundred, hundred listens a week, you That's know, and all the, all, all the shit we've, we've dealt with. I mean, look at, look at the, the stuff that, you know, with noodle, look at snaps, all, all the harassment snaps gets. I mean, she gets some disgusting stuff posted to her, you know, and she handles it really well. Um, but, you know, I mean, there has to be. A discussion on the topic within the community and it has to be something that becomes something that how do we get better you know and and I thought that was a big thing with with the summit you know everyone has their their theories and ideas and speculations about what the the summit was for and the the effects that the people that were there the the number one thing the summit was for was for trying to rebuild and repair relationship between Bungie and the community because it had gotten so toxic where people were just talking at and not talking to each other and to try to open up lines of dialogue to try to have that give and take on a civil you know of civil discussion you know and not not all the just like I said, the bullshit that was going on from October until whatever, February. I mean, it was so bad, you know, I mean, just terrible. And so I think it's been better. And I, I think that, you know, going to content creators, you know, I, I think that people with big footprints, they needed to understand that this hate culture and all this, you know, the attacks and, and where it leads the other side of it, that there are real people on the other side of all these comments and, and drumming up all this, you know, the, the, the cr crowds into a frenzy and getting people raising the pit forks and chanting, you know, there are lives on the other side. Those are real people that have, have families that have, grown up being gamers and fans of of Bungie or or Halo or whatever, you know, and and they're they're living a dream and they care as much about 
the game as anyone, if not more, you know, they're, they're putting their lives into it and in all the countless hours to try to make something and to, to suffer the abuse, you know, I mean, the stuff RWG that we've dealt with, you know, the people, the, the shit that they say, and we know the real world effect it has on our end. And, you know, it, it's not right. You know, it's, it's not right. And it just can't be just not talked about and swept away, just like any other, you know, social issue that, that goes on. The, the, the problems with, with racism, you know, xenophobia and all the other shit, you know, that, that's going on in the country. It can't be ignored. You know, it needs to be discussed because it's a problem, you know. And if you don't talk about stuff, nothing's ever going to get better. You know, if you don't try to find ways, what's the solution to to all the crap going on on Twitter? What's the solution to all the things going on 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 Bnet? You know, how can you make Destiny a more accessible game where people can have a safe, friendly social experience and get on and play together and be able to talk to each other? You know, I'd love to go into Destiny and have it not be default opt-out chat. And, and I'd love to be able to go into the game and be opted in and have other players to talk to, you know, and, and, and to be that um, environment that used to exist, you know, back, back in, the, in the early days of Xbox Live where you could go and just start playing Gears of War with random strangers and come out with a, a full friends list from these people that you met. You know, that doesn't exist anymore. But, Those were the day. Yeah, but you know, it it needs it, like I said, it just it just needs to be. And why doesn't it, it exist anymore? I, I doesn't exist anymore because it got so toxic. You know, you've got this, and and, and the mo- majority of the people playing are cool, but the people that are toxic and do live to ruin the experience for everyone. And so those are the people that you want to address and and there it is near impossible to change the minds of people who have an agenda. And if no, their agenda their minds. is to be a bully or a troll, but, that's but not going to change. But you can empower them. And and they're empowered because they they found that they do have power. They've which with the arena net, it's just exacerbated that because They've they've seen that they can get people fired from jobs by creating these accounts and going and bombarding the company. And look at the results. You know, look, they saw what they... Bungie, there was a test run with SBMM when the forums were flooded with all the spam on SBMM. And, and they got away with that. And so it led to the Eververse. And, and it became triple, quadruple you know, quintuple there because they got away with it the first time. You know, you, you, we have a, a, a game where because there's a fear that someone might be a dick and someone might ruin the experience that we can't have matchmaking for, for nightfalls or we, we have limited, you know, ways to, to group for raids or any other thing people want. We have a PVP where we go in and you know, everyone complains, well, it's not fair to play solo versus fire team, blah, blah. Well, you know, it would be fair if you were just opted into chat and the other solo players were opted into chat and then you could communicate just like the people on the fire team. But that's not the situation exists because there's that percentage of the population that live to ruin shit. And so they dictate play for everyone else. They dictate the experience for everyone else. And, and it's bullshit. That right, the lowest but, common denominator cost Right, but you're talking about children. I mean, Bungie has to be also mindful that there are children playing this game. You can't let some guy or girl come into a party or into a fire team and start saying all kinds of shit with a, with a kid in there. I mean, they have to do... The, they're taking steps to protect from the very stuff that you're saying... Um, we have to address and but and I, that's their I, way I of addressing it i understand that but that's why not have that be the option when if you're if your kid's getting online to play that you can set it up where they're opted out of chat 
why do you opt out everyone because someone's but you can opt in <laughs> you can opt in but no one does it it's not intuitive there's nothing there's nothing when you go to the the screen that's intuitive to opt into chat to say hey it tells you right then you can opt in as soon as you go into a, a strike it tells you hit b or whatever to turn on the chat it does give you the option to do it it's just that it, most people don't it's true i don't it's, yeah it's true it's there it's 50 50 but like it is still one feels immediately more inclusive and one feels less inclusive like one feels like where you know you're ready to get it done and one is like well i don't need to bother with that and I wish that it was in that place, you know, years ago where it'd be like, I could be fine, you know, just like running into a voice chat. And no one's going to say anything to me or, you know, try and just start like tearing you down. Like you hope for that, but it, it isn't like that right now. So I think if you're aware of that, number one, that's good. Number two, like we can either just, it's with any, like you were saying, with any social issue, you can either just like let this sort of shitty side faster or you can straight up just like call it out like that's the big thing i know a lot of streamers who literally just try and convert trolls there are some people who are in there to just you know piss you off try and say terrible things try and use terrible words to like upset you and then there are people who you know are saying it because they're hurt because they don't know why they're saying it they're kids they're people who you say hey like why are you you know saying what you're saying and then they stop. They have to think for a second. Why are you doing this? And um, even if that's even if that second just makes them think, you know, you might change. I don't think it's a world full of bullies and you know not bullies. And those bullies are never going to change, and they're never going to um, they're never going to be any good, or they're never going to be redeemable because you know, like sometimes a good person can end up bullying it's 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 about mentality it's about making sure that we're creating the right environment as players making sure the company is doing as much as they can to you know stop that from happening but you know uh, it's always it's always a struggle it's like a it's it's going to be the struggle the whole time i wish it, i wish it wasn't i think to a large extent that people uh, gamers have been conditioned to not speak as well you know I, I think that we're conditioned from three and a half years of destiny to go in and if we're playing solo to to not want to or expect to talk to anyone um and now it just it feels natural to go into a to a pvp match and be solo and no one say anything where three and a half years ago when i first got destiny it was the weirdest thing ever that I'm in the crucible and no one's talking to each other and I, I couldn't understand it, you know? Um, and I, I don't know that it can ever go back to, to what it was. Um, you know, I wish that rather than, you know, destiny releasing with everything, just being automatic opt out, you know, that there just would have been more systems in place to where if someone was a problem, it was easy to mute them and to, you know, report or whatever, and 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 to to not have to continue to put up with it, rather than to just take it away completely. Because, like I said, at this point, I think I think it's been conditioned in, and this is just kind of how it is. But um, I don't know. It just sucks because you know, again, going to to Guardian Con and all all the good that's there, and you know, all the all the cool people that are out there and um tim and i were playing tim of tacoma um playing mayhem yesterday the day before and i think it's yesterday and um the topic uh, tkl was in there kung lao and somehow the topic of pokemon came up and you know they're talking about playing pokemon go with their kids and tim brought up that it was kind of a neat experience for him because you know they'd be at like a park or something and you'd see someone else on their phone and they'd be like, hey, are you looking for Pokemon? And they'd be like, yeah, and they'd start a conversation. And it's this thing that connected them and, you know, where normally, you know, you're there and people don't talk to each other in the in the world. Like, you know, so you true. Know, it's, it's, it's not what it used to be when you used to have the neighborhood, you know, grocery stores and neighborhood, you know, hardware stores and, and communities and people talked and, 
and and more social. You know, everyone's really isolated. But here's this, you know, he said it's it was weird because, you know, like normally, you know, you'd just be just talking to your family and people wouldn't talk to each other. But here they were talking and striking up conversations with strangers because they're connected by this this game. And I told him, you know, that was the same thing with the um, the reveal event when uh, we were there at WG and when I got to go to the summit, you know, is that, you know, Riley, I met, met you there and. You know, we we never spoken. I had no. I actually had had right. seen you your tweets and didn't realize it was you at the time. But you know, I didn't know you. And there we were, and we're brought together by Destiny, and we're talking about the game. And like, I we talked for a while that night, and it was really cool getting to meet you and you know talk about what you do with the film and all that. And you know, there's so many incredible positives that can be had by this you know destiny is again it's an experience that really has brought so many people together and done such amazing things you know people from all over the world and you know rwg all the people that we had on the podcast from how many different countries and all over the globe and it's it's got that ability but it can't build any of the social features into the game because it's got to cater to the lowest common denominator and what they might do. Yeah, yeah, that's true. It brings people together. Like, I see someone on the street with the Destiny shirt. I'm stopping them. I am saying hi to them. You know, like, it brings people together. The Guardian Con event, yeah, the summit was great. Having to have a couple drinks with you guys, you know, uh, talk your ears off, just ask questions. It's it's a great time. And uh, even even the uh, the uh, the Paramount the Paramount event for uh, PAX when they had the the like, what was it called? It wasn't the D two reveal because the D two reveal was the one done in L A. This was the D two experience. That's what it was called, the D two experience. And you know, like getting to talk with some of the devs there. Some of the devs are locals, so you can you um you know I I see them at events and certain things, but it's so powerful the connections that have been made by this game and it, that's true we're set up right now to operate having to cater to the worst you want it to be that peak that pinnacle of people getting to know each other community being together but right now everything is fo- you, you, you know like you're focused on the bad kid and you're not you know helping the other kids uh, grow you're, you're too focused on the negative. You know, you're like, well, don't give them that. And you make sure, you know, blah, 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 blah. Put them in their box so it doesn't happen to them. As opposed to, like, oust those that need to be ousted. Well, until they can figure out a way to oust those people, I don't think it's going to happen. Right. It's not gonna, And it's not going to be that. It's not going to be, like, getting rid of them. It's going to be, uh, one, either, you know, transitioning them, like, turning the community making them a better person or hopefully they turn away and you know it's never going to be 100% we're never only going to have the best people but uh, we can try and surround ourselves with them at least and at least not letting uh, these moments sort of those times in, in you know when you're in a fire team or you know you hear someone say something and you're like oh my gosh did they really just say that but you don't want to say anything because it becomes a thing Maybe just like, you know, shed light on that. Saying, hey, no, this isn't okay. We're not going to let this continue. Kind of like the word boop. <laughs> How do we feel about the word boop? RWG is no. a fan of the word boop. No. <laughs> I don't know who created it, but just no. Everyone in my fire team knows that that is not the appropriate word that you use. What's the what's the one for the tether? Like, I don't even know what they say when they tether. Like, marinate. Marinate. Just let it yeah. marinate. Just let it marinate. Marinate and then boop is is RWG's favorite combination. Have you ever been booped in you know real life? Have you ever you know looked deeply into someone's eyes and then just had them boop you right on the nose? Because that's oh, almost God. worse. That's almost worse. Let me tell. Yeah, I just can't take it. I just cannot take it. I don't know what it is about the word and how it's used, but I hate it. And then everybody knows it, so then they just keep on saying it just to piss me off. 
Right. Oh gosh. See, that's when it's fun and like lighthearted, and that's where I feel like <laughs> it's like like it's toxicity light because it's your friends doing it, you know. And so it's fun. And then it always happens where you know someone uh, starts doing something that you don't like, but you don't know them. You're, you're like this sort of playful meanness. I don't like this from you, stranger. Yeah. Fortunately for me, I I have a small group of people that I like to hang around with, and I know them well enough that I know that they're. They're not uh, assholes, which is good. Do you do you receive a lot of um uh like just gender bullshit in the Destiny community as opposed to other games that you've played? Yes, regularly. It's still there and present. Yep. Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah. Because yeah, I mean, there's the Miss Noodle thing, and I don't know. I guess I I I, I thought Destiny was different, and in many ways it is, but in that you know. In that way, that's that affects the entire industry, not just you know specific games. Well, I just think it's everybody in every game. You know, I mean, that's why Guardian Con and you know the the people that are higher up in the community that do a lot of the positive things. Those are the people that you need to surround yourself around, especially if you're really low tolerance of all the bad part of Destiny. You just have to just let that go. It has nothing to do with you. It has to do with them. And I and I just don't... I'm not going to pay those people mine. I'm not going to give them a minute. I don't respond to it. I, I just... I used to, back in the early days of Xbox, if somebody would send me a message... I mean, remember that ranking thing that they would have up? You know, you could, you could go in and score people. And, you know, you could look at their profile to see how many complaints they had against them and, or if they were toxic. And, and even some accounts now, they... They show right there on the account, this person is so toxic, you don't even want to have them on your friends list kind of a thing. And, uh, you know, I used to respond, but I've learned over the years that it is just not worth giving them one ounce of acknowledgement. It just doesn't. And then they and they usually don't respond. I mean, obviously, they'll, they may follow up a couple times, but most of the time they just die off. Just let them die off because, you know without being able to control how they act the only thing that you have is your control and in my control i just shut them down i just don't even give them the chance to you know and if if somebody comes into my party that is um that i don't know that's friends and friends of someone else um that i don't know and they start shooting off shit i'm just I either leave the party or kick them I mean, it, I don't even give them a chance to explain themselves. I don't need to hear your reasons or know, understand where you're coming from. I just don't need to surround myself with that kind of shit. That's actually that's actually a really good um, uh, mentality. You know, like they're putting out this negative energy. You don't need to give them any of your energy. Like that's just going to be taxing on you, and it's going to be what they want. But if you don't give them that, they'll eventually fall off because they're just you know taxing themselves before they realize, you know, I'm not, I'm not getting anything from this. Yeah. It's just not worth the energy. I mean, who needs to hear this stupid shit, you know, get, go somewhere else and do that, but I don't need to be around it. Right. Like, first of all, it's, you're not original. I've heard it before. <laughs> Second of all, like get out. There was a guy years ago and he was infamous on YouTube for going into people's parties. This was before you could make them private and he would jump in your parties and he would just talk shit. And he came into our party one night, and oh my god, this guy had everybody yelling. I mean, everybody was screaming and yelling at this guy, and he was just loving it. And I learned from that moment, after, I, after we looked him up and figured out what his gig was, and I learned from that moment on, you don't give these people a minute. You don't give them one second of your energy because that's what they get off on and i'm not going to be a, i'm not going to be a party to it i think it's important too to um for for again the the people that have the voices in the community to to not get caught up and and to feed into that and, and to propagate that all as well you know i, I think that's that's a huge thing and I, I think that has been something that has changed the last uh, the last couple months uh, for for the better. And again, I think people understand, and you know, we're seeing more and more, 
you know, acknowledgement of what what's really going on with these people that do that and what their motivations are. And, you know, just hopefully um, there's there's some energy put into to figuring out ways to make things better uh, to, to kind of counterbalance the energy that that small group puts into trying to make things worse. Well, I mean, that's why I left BNET, right? That's why, you know, I mean, the, the mute button is there. You can ignore those people and not acknowledge them and continue forward with, with, you know, posting there if you want to. But, you know, I don't know of the new changes that they've made. I have gone there a few times and I've seen the people that used to be pretty toxic. I don't see them there that much anymore. So maybe they took care of a lot of it, but it, there's still people that are toxic. I mean, I, I just feel like, you know, you have to take the good with the bad and it is, some of it is feedback that, you know, not only towards what you're posting and what you're saying, you know, you have to accept that people have a different view than you do. It's just the delivery. You know, if somebody's going to say you're shit, then that's not really, that doesn't tell me anything about what your comment is to what I just said. You know, can you elaborate a little bit or is your intellect only allowing you to say these four words or three words or whatever? And then you just mute them. But if somebody comes back and says, I disagree because this, this, and this, and this, then that's a, that's a good discussion. And I don't mind that kind of interaction with people that disagree with me or, or don't like how I view things and, and it can say it in a way that, um, can be, a discussion but if if you only can just say your shit and everything you do sucks and whatever then they're just they're not worth the time just mute them so true so true yeah see you're yeah i'm always up for a debate i'm always up for a discussion i'm ready but yeah that's true that the distinction between outright toxicity for the sake of toxicity versus <laughs> Maybe you're not you know, like, hold on, come on. You're not using enough words right now. I know you're typing and I'm talking, but you know, let's, let's have a constructive conversation uh, or debate, you know, like let's, let's try and create something here and it's possible. It is possible, but yeah, with outright toxicity for the sake of toxicity, there is there uh, like, right. There, there seems to be no other, um, solution, which is upsetting. But it's just like, get it out. Get it out. Not today, Satan. <laughs> Church lady. <laughs> you know it. I'm a god warrior. So uh, to, to turn the, the topic to to some, some positivity, um, we always uh, end with kind of favorite moments playing Destiny. And I'd kind of want to expand on that just a little. And I'll start with you, Riley. What... Are you looking forward to the most uh, with Forsaken? And what has been your favorite moment of playing Destiny recently? What I'm most looking forward to would probably be, it's not even necessarily the the game or what the game is going to be bringing me, but sort of the community coming back together around that time and getting back together, seeing these old friendships again, you know, like for, for some, it's been a year for some longer, you know, for some, it's just been a couple of weeks or a couple of months, but there are some people who haven't played in a while and they're like, well, I'll finally make my way back for forsaken. And that's very exciting to me, getting the community back together because it is a different game. You know, it's still destiny, but it's a different game with different people playing. And, um, I'm just sort of excited to see people come back and you have seen that every once in a while with each of the DLC releases. Um, I, I feel like I saw it a lot more with Warmind because there was sort of that grinding nature to it that people were coming back and people were sticking around a bit longer. Um, I, I also, you know, I, at first I hated the idea of, uh, at first I hated the idea of multiple, uh, what was it? Like three shotguns. I was like, excuse me, three shot. We don't know her. No, three shotguns. No, but, um, no, I'm actually, uh, I'm excited to start to get a little trolley with, uh, my, uh, with my weapon layout. So that's going to be fun. And let's see, what was, what was a great, um, destiny moment in recent, uh, in recent time. I'm trying to think, Ooh, uh, you know what it was, was honestly, um, this kind of goes back into the whole opt in, opt out, uh, uh, voice channel thing. Uh, it was just, uh, it was just uh what was it was a flashpoint on titan and um you gotta 
you gotta open all of those little pri- those little ball prisons that have the the fire cannons before you uh, take out the first walker to trigger the heroic event. Triggering the heroic event, it's a big sort of like. <laughs> There seems to be a, a big disconnect for PC players and triggering the heroic event. I, and I so, think that's everywhere. Oh, you, you, you're probably right. You're probably right. It's a year in, and you're like, guys, 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 can we, can we focus up? But um, it was actually really interesting uh, starting to interact because I hadn't, you know, I used to be a solo player, and there's no, uh, you know, there's no like, uh, there's no voice chat for everyone just chilling on Titan. But I. Uh, I was like started throwing things into the text chat and like starting to get people being like, Oh, okay, next time, you know, we'll do it. Like it was so rewarding because that second time it comes around, we open all the fire cannons and the second Walker blows. And like after people are like actually thanking me and that was incredible. See, that's cool. So see, so PC does have a way to bridge that gap and, and allow you to talk to people in a zone um so you can just type in chat and everyone that's in the zone can read it on pc yeah yeah see that's 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 it exactly is finding things like that to kind of bridge that gap where you can give people ways to you know to to communicate and and at least connect and have foundations to like even like hey why don't we party up or whatever but even then to to say hey you know you need to put the put the ball in the hole, dude. <laughs> honestly, honestly, and yeah, it's a little it's a little less involved. Um, I don't know. Sometimes a voice, at least nowadays, a voice suddenly someone being like, "Anyone got a mic? Anyone got a mic?" You're you're a little um you're a little off put by it. And I mean, we're all kind of introverts, even if we're extroverted introverts. There's a reason we you know enjoy this content that we can consume right there from the from the glory of our own home. And so it's it's hard sometimes for people to open up that way, even with people you know within their own uh, interest group. But yeah, it's it's just a little bit, a, you know, one step down from a voice chat. It's not intrusive. It just shows up. You can respond to it or not. And uh, I, I found it pretty helpful, you know, as I switched over to PC. That would be a nightmare on Xbox. The elite controllers don't have the chat. Yeah pad and i can barely muster out okay or yes <laughs> oh, i, I, I hate it I, I ended up throwing like a little um like a a little like usb um keyboard into my uh playstation at one point because i when i needed to type i was like this is i can't do this anymore i can't do this anymore oh it's just terrible i hate it yeah an xbox chat you know it, it was always bad for having to do that but I don't know what's been going on with it, but their chat and their UI, every time they update it, it just gets worse and worse, and everything takes like 10 minutes to load. It may or may not give you a notice <laughs> that something is sent. Um, like 75% of the time, you don't even get a notice that someone sent you an invite or a chat. It's Yeah, it's a nightmare on there. Yeah, it's been pretty bad lately. And, and going to the, to the public events rally, our, our friend Tim of Tacoma, he... <laughs> We're in a party, and he'll be doing the, um, the uh, whatever the, I, I don't even remember what it's called. You know, your daily or weekly thing on the planet, and he'll be doing the public events for it. And he's constantly like, "Come on, why, why don't you guys know how to turn this heroic?" He'll be doing like, <laughs> right the, the hive one where they shoot the crystal, and they he's like, "They're not, they won't shoot the crystal," you know. And you know, obviously, everyone you know gets the taken one wrong. No one can do the taken thing. They all kill the little bubbles instead of stepping in and using them to get damage for the vein one. But yeah, it's it's funny that you brought that up. But that's that is so cool. The PC allows you to do that. I wish that uh, we'd get cross uh, cross save. You know, I, I know that's a topic that's been coming up. I hear um, Arrow Knight and uh, and Cyber Sasquatch have talked about it a lot on the uh, Destiny Reset podcast and. You know, it would really be cool if Sony got on board with at least not cross play, at least cross save. Where if you own Destiny, if you on Xbox, if you bought it on PC, or if you bought it on PlayStation, you could still go on and play your same character. It would be so cool, you know. And rather than, well, if I want to get it on PC, you know, I have to start a whole new account and start from scratch and you know, make another character and, you know, level that along with the Xbox. And I don't know, it'd just be cool if they, 
they did that at some point. I think it would uh, sell a lot of systems for everyone. It would. It would definitely be a. It definitely be a win for everyone. I. I. I what I did was I when I uh, when I moved to um, PC, I just started creating um, those characters. Like I took my Hunter from PlayStation. I took my Titan from Xbox, and would just recreate them on PC because I was like, I still need y'all with me. You're coming with. If I can't get you uh, the normal way, you're coming with. That's right, man. What about you, RWG? What are you looking forward to the most with Forsaken? And what's been uh, your favorite moment playing Destiny recently? Well, if they don't come out with new pink shaders, I'm not going to be happy. I'm looking forward to the <laughs> shaders. <laughs> I really am looking forward to the shaders. That's really my biggest thing. Um, everything else I don't know about other than things that I know about that I can't talk about. But I do... You know, I'm I am looking forward to some of the new armor, and um, I'm not looking forward to random rolls, but I am looking forward to shaders and and new armor. Yeah, opening up random rolls again it, it made me it made me sort of feel like it was like ah like that was that that was a big aspect of sort of the grind at one point. It was a big gripe too. You know, I can't get this. You know, Luna, blah 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 blah. blah. So it'll be interesting. Um, I wonder if it's going to be changed or, you know, if it's going to be affected at all, where there's, they're going to try and minimize the idea of the god role, or if it's just going to immediately fall back into where it was before, where it's like, this is the archetype you want, um, you know, you want this role, if you don't have that role, it's garbage, it's garbage, man, it's garbage. Yeah, and then I wonder what's going to happen to our th- with our existing guns, will they suddenly have roles, or... I no, was wondering that as the, well. They they said they're staying, the, the ones that... Uh, or in the game will stay static rolls. Only the new weapons will be the uh, random rolls. New weapons meaning um, only new the uh, ones coming in styles Forsaken. archetypes. The, the, okay, the, the, the weapons coming in Forsaken will have random rolls, but anything that was pre for, 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 God, that's a tongue twister. Pre Forsaken will be the uh, static rolls still. So um, better devils will always be the same better devils. It's not to get new rolls for it. That's that's smart, I guess. You know, going forward, being eyes wide open, like we can go back to random rolls, but not suddenly. Some people have the god roll of this gun, and some people are, you know, jit. I I just hope that the random rolls are tempered, and that it's maybe you know like a handful of 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 possible rolls you can get on it. You know, maybe five, six. You know, maybe maybe a, a little more than that, but not the whatever it was i mean there were so many combinations you could have and never get what you wanted in d1 and i hope we don't go back to that if it's going to be random you know keep it at keep it at like six six possible roles and at least have a chance eventually to get the one of the six that you want i think would be uh more what i'm hoping to see there and and what do you think yeah and, and what do you think, uh, RWG, about episode uh, 65 and a half? There better be pink shaders. <laughs> there better be pink shaders. Did we get any pink shaders or any good pink shaders during Crimson Days? No, they were terrible. One looked like uh, the Abysmal, uh, and the other one was, I don't know, like red. I mean, they were okay, but... And they they have two pink shaders that are okay, but man, we need some more pink shaders. And at the end of the day, it also has to do with, like, the actual armor. Because sometimes the shader can be killer, but, you know, the way it falls onto a piece, you're like, excuse me? Yeah, like, it looks all, like, rusty and, I don't know. It's weird. So what's been your favorite uh, recent moment playing? Um, well, actually, yesterday, when I was finishing up opening all the chests, it reminded me a lot of D1 and that everybody appeared to be looking for chests because I was seeing people in places that I know they haven't been before and everybody was like looking around for those chests, the region chests and, you know, and people were showing over here, over here, shooting the area where it was. And, and that reminded me a lot of D1 when people were actually going out looking for collectibles and helping each other find them. And that kind of, um, that was kind of cool to experience yesterday. Our, uh, our, it, that just made me think of when you um, were helping me do the sword quest and we were on the moon. And didn't we, uh, was it chests that we were looking for on the moon? Yeah, we had to open up those chests for the materials. Yeah, and remember we had we had those two uh, 
the two randoms that were following us and you had a little procession behind you as we ran around the moon for a couple hours chasing down those chests. Yeah, I mean, it just it just kind of, those are the kind of moments that remind me a lot about how Destiny 1 was because, you know, you sort of, even though you couldn't communicate with people, people sort of knew what you were doing and you could sort of help them do things and, and uh, anyway, so I thought that was kind of cool. And the fact that um, Mayhem was yesterday, was the last day for Mayhem, and I was able to bang out Legend on my uh, character for that um, Triumph thing. I didn't think it was going to take me, it wasn't going to be so short. I only did it like five hours, so it was kind of cool. Only five. Not too bad for a grand. Yeah, it wasn't bad with Mayhem because those games go by so fast. Um, you know, you could just bang away at it, and, and, and it goes really quick because once you win games, it starts to stack um, your wins, and then you get more XP, and so we were winning a lot, so we had a lot of stacked XP to, to rise our uh, ranking pretty quickly. So it, w- it went pretty fast. I was surprised. That's really cool. Plus, I like Mayhem. <laughs> yeah. I-, I thought the Mayhem was really fun. I know there were a lot of a lot of complaints about the uh, the tether and, and that which we shall not name with the tractor cannon. We'll just call it tractor cannoning. It doesn't roll off the tongue as well, but... Um, Tractoring. <laughs> there you go. Tractoring. I'm going to plow <laughs> this thing now. <laughs> Plowing away. Oh my god. Yeah, that yeah. I I had fun with it though. Souls, what do you uh what are you most looking forward to? You know, with Forsaken, I think probably the raid and the um Dreaming City and just seeing how exactly that plays out. I don't, you know, I I've spoken a lot on previous podcasts and one of my favorite absolute favorite things in destiny one was the um mission in vault of glass for prey to ghosts the paradox mission and i really thought that's what we were going to get more of in destiny 2 when they were removing the grimoire that they were going to have more extended missions like that optional extended missions that told the the story and gave the lore in game and it obviously didn't kind of happen like that but my hope is with this raid zone being something that's going to be playable outside of the raid that that's something we're going to see more of is that type of experience um where you can get in and really do some cool exploration like that with some really cool like story that you can get into because i mean that was just such an incredible experience and the raid itself um I just, you know, I'm I'm hopeful that it gets back to kind of what um what we all loved about Destiny raiding. I I, I still like the raids in in D2 and the uh the Leviathan, the Eater of Worlds was one of the best things Bungie's ever done, but um I think it just got too overboard with the the mechanics and too punishing on time limits and mechanics with uh with Spire of Stars, so I'm I'm interested to see what direction they go with the raid, and if they can bring back more of that balance of of actual gunplay and not so mechanic heavy, um, and let people have a little more freedom and not tying everyone to to doing specific things every three seconds. So uh, that that's what I'm most most looking forward to there. Yeah, I gotta get someone to uh, I gotta find some PC peeps to run me through uh, the raid on PC now. The spire is brutal, man. I mean, it is just brutal. You want to go in with people that know and have done it, and even in that case, it's still brutal. The other one, I think, is much better. Um, I forgot what it's called. The other raid layer is um, is a little bit more enjoyable. It's not so punishing. Yeah, it, it, I remember sort of the 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 vibes of the release for the first raid layer and how it was just sort of it was satisfying. And then this one definitely was sort of like wow, mechanic heavy. And I mean that was the one that ended with like you know a real world location and there was like you know like geocaching sort of. And it was like there was a lot going on in that one. But um, uh, if it was taxing, it still seemed. Um, I, I hope it still s- s- felt rewarding for the people doing it. Because I know, um, you know, when we were first doing Leviathan, 
uh, we we were doing it blind. We didn't want to see what anyone else was doing. And I mean, we didn't make it through on our first run, but just going, oh, we do this or we do that or this is the mechanic. That learning of the uh, learning the mechanics. And I mean, hopefully it's in a non-competitive setting because then people just get upset. But learning those mechanics, that's that's always so fun. Realizing it with your friends, you know, figuring it out, trying it again. I'm excited. Yeah, I mean, the the thing about raids, I think they, they get to the point where wiping 20 times is sort of tolerable. But when you're wiping 100 times because it's so precision and mechanic heavy, that's where I think things start to get a little bit too, you know, too much. And, and if they really want to go towards that way where you really have to be very precise and, you know, very mechanic and, you know, you have to be able to multitask on a whim, you know, I, I understand that too. You know, that's, that's a challenge, but I, I'm just not, I don't think I'm really interested in it. If it goes that way, then I, I probably won't do it. I've done, I've done it enough that I have all the clothes, all the armor and all three characters. And, and I probably will never go in that right again. I, I just dislike it that much. Let me ask you this, RWG. King's Fall. We ran, we had everything in there, and then still ran it like eight times a week after we didn't need anything from it. You know, we we would get as many people as we could and take them through so they could experience it. And that was, there were mechanics in King's Fall, and it was a really um, in-depth fight for Oryx. But the difference to me was... That was something where when you wiped in King's Fall, you knew what your, your problems were. You knew it was because you didn't have the, the DPS in a certain spot, whether it be on the ogres, or you knew that you know someone wasn't strong enough on a plate. You could isolate the problem and, and, and try to fix it. You, we, and there were nights that you know it just didn't happen. you know, for whatever reason, you know you, you just couldn't get it done. But you knew what was making you fail and the thing with the the regular leviathan and the callus fight and now with spire phase two is that you can wipe for hours and it just be something different every time and it's it's not that situation where you say well if we just clean up this one thing you know we've got this because there's so much that can go wrong over the course of these fights, you know, in, in the, in the shade, you know, you can get flung up in the air or, you know, you can get glitched through the wall or, you know, whatever, you know, something can happen on the outside and, and you can wipe a million times and it never be the same thing twice. And the same thing, you know, with, with Spire, you know, oh, well, you, we didn't uh, get the, the hot potato thrown in time or, you know, the, to me, the 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 biggest um, failure of that fight is having to juggle the three orbs again before you throw him up when he raises his hand, because it just it's it seems like such an unnecessary thing. Because up till then, it's a fun fight. You're killing the ads and going up to space and coming down, but then you have this break where you just stop for like a minute and a half, and you have to throw these things and and manage your your greed and manage your whatever the other one is and and then if you are off by half a second it's a wipe it's done you know or or someone someone holds on to it a half second too long and it it just brings in this frustration that just wasn't there in king's fall and i like i said i don't would you kind of agree with that sentiment and that experience for you as well well i mean it's just it, it's just a lot that you have to do in succession that um, you know, not a lot of people can remember to do, you know, I mean, there's, it's not just one step. Okay. Clear group. Now do a next step, clear group. And that's sort of how taken King was. It was very systematic. It was predictable. And, you know, it was just, um, you know, getting your head wrapped around it. This one is different in that there's so many different steps that if one person fails to do that one step, it's over for everyone. And everyone's roles is constantly rotating. So you, so everyone has to know what those steps are and adhere to them. And when you get six people in a room doing that 50 times over and over and over, after a while, it starts to fall apart. And that's the part that I don't like. I don't even, 
as I consider myself an experienced raider and those people that I raid with are after a while, if you're unsuccessful because, you know, you've made a mistake or you've forgotten a step, you know, that it shouldn't have to punish so deeply. And I think that's sort of what this raid sort of did. Like you can't, you know, there's not a lot of room for clutch moments to pick up the slack if somebody sort of messes up. And and I think like in raids like Vault of Glass, there was a lot of um, areas where clutch moments were possible. And in those cases, it really brought the team together in the end if you actually completed it because first of all you were relieved and secondly you know you're joining your friends and thanking them for getting you through it you know like if if you didn't make it you know so this one is more you know god damn it you know you 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 forgot to you know get the ball whatever it's called and you know and you just feel like you're a failure and 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 after a while it just sort of does I think wear you down and I, and I don't think that's how raid should be. I think raid should sort of be more built on teamwork and lifting each other up to get through it rather than depending on, you know, one person performing five things in the right way. I mean, it's already chaotic enough and, you know, you, everyone has to really be on their game and I think that's okay for maybe a prestige raid. But for a normal raid, I, I don't think it should be so uh, brutal. Yeah, those those mechanics were, um, they might have been not necessarily punishing. It was, in Taken King, you know, if you didn't do something, you're like, okay, we got to wipe, do it again. But it wasn't frustrating in, in the same way. You, you, uh, and yeah, there would, you would, you would continue to do it. You would get your group together. You'd do it, you know, a couple times a week. You, you, even once you were finished, even once you had all the raid gear, it was still like, well, you know, this is what we do. We know how to do it. It's a good time doing it. Let's give it a go. As opposed to t- that taxing nature, the punishing nature of what seems to be these new raids. Well, and also going to King's Fall, you know, that's, that's it exactly with, you know, being able to pick each other up, you know, how many times were we in there where we had someone that um, had trouble picking up their night and you were in the center on ogres or you were on another platform and you'd be able to get their night for them. Well, that's what I mean. Like people could pick up or, you know, cut, you know, it was a team effort. Like there was the ability to be able to do that. There really isn't that um, in this in this last raid that they have, I mean, you really have to pull your own weight. You really have to have your own, um, you know, roll down. And, and if you're, and if you fail in any way, you know, it affects everybody and everybody knows it. And, and sometimes that's taxing. I also thought the wrath of the machine was very mechanic based and I didn't like that raid either. So it may just be my preference in, you know, I don't like bullet sponges. I'm not promoting that. I don't mind stages that you have to get through to get to the final, you know, final boss kill or whatever. But I I really don't like mechanic heavy raids, especially because we're depending on everyone's connections. And, you know, sometimes, you know, there's a lot of glitches that are happening during that moment. And, and, you know, that also will be a failure because, you know, of lag or whatever. And so it's really dependent on a clean, smooth run where everybody knows their role and what to do and be on it. And, and I don't really like sweaty raids. And I, I would say Spire is sort of sweaty. Yeah, I think it's the arbitrariness of, of the roles where you just don't know. I mean, that, I think that's what made Eater of Worlds kind of so great is that you had your roles, okay, you three are going to be defenders, you three are going to be runners, and if a runner, you know, doesn't have time to cook their skull, they can call out, hey, to the defender, can you go, you know, put put in an arc for me or whatever, and it, it's funny, you go back to Vault of Glass, and that was one of the changes they made that everyone kind of hated was when it came out, you could set it up where you knew who was going to get uh, pulled into the future of the past, and then they, they randomized that. And there was also the uh, the randomized who would go into the the shade on the uh, the sisters as well or the daughters or whatever, and that was uh, th- those were kind of the things that were the, the the least popular of those, and that's kind of what what this new raid 
you know, hones in on and focuses in on is that making everyone know and do every role and, and that randomization of it. Well, all right. I got nothing else. <laughs> well, I will, I will say my favorite moment playing cause I haven't is, uh, I have barely played my Titan in D2 had moments where I enjoyed playing it, but finally, uh, got into a groove playing it when I, uh, went back to striker, just going back to lightning grenades has just been incredible. And I've, I've had a lot of fun, regular quick play and mayhem being on the striker Titan again. I'm, I'm looking forward to also with forsaken to see what the new, uh, striker super is with the the uh, death from above and if it's just a single hit um super and not a roaming super and that's kind of my hope with that because we're it's something we were talking about uh doing strikes yesterday was you get to the the boss and i just wish if i was on my striker i could just go in do one hit with my fist of havoc and get the hell out and have it do a bunch of damage because when you try to use it in pve you go in, you maybe get a hit off, and then invariably the boss does a stomp and you get knocked back 500 yards and you can't hit him again. So the rest of the roaming supers is kind of wasted uh, on the bosses and PB, in, in, in my opinion, for, for that. But yeah, so that's been, for me, um, just kind of getting back into the striker again. Went on a nice 20, had a 25 and five streak uh, in quick play. Uh, Hello. The week before mayhem, yeah. Solo queuing and quick play. Excellent. So it so it can be done, but yeah, I was I was having a blast. I was using uh, Better Devils uh, Requiem Forty Five and Telesto and Telesto. Oh, that's the other. <gasps> Telesto is disgusting. Oh, I saw that clip. That was a good little. I miss Telesto. Yeah. So I take Telesto and I rather than. You know, I'll shoot people with it, but I use it like I'll shoot the ground or a wall and just let people run into it and kill themselves. And it's yep. freaking hilarious. Like people come charging with a hammer. You just shoot the Telesto on the ground, step behind a corner. They come running through, run over it dead. So, yeah, so Telesto, is, Telesto is awesome, man. Well, really appreciate you coming on, Riley. Thank you for joining us today. Guys, this was a great time. This was really, I'm really, I'm really happy I was able to do this. This is, this has been a really good time. And, um, Souls, did you say you're going to be at GC? I am not going to be at GC, mm. sadly. I wish, but, uh, yeah. Happens, it happens. But I, I, I hope. Tell me, tell me what you hope, Souls. Oh, I was just going to say, I hope everyone has a, a wonderful time there that does get to go. It, I, I look forward to seeing all the, uh, all the, uh, tweets and pictures that people put up um been watching uh Cobb and uh Farian uh post pictures of the art uh Lay Summerstone you know posting the stuff that they're going to have there and just just looking forward to seeing you know all the meetups and and know uh know it's going to be a great time and hopefully uh next year be able to to take part well, it, yep, it just keeps getting bigger and better. So you know, whenever whenever you get around to it, it, you'll you won't be disappointed. That's for sure. Yeah. Oh yeah, the art the art from the community is one of those incredible things. Yeah, seeing Farian or Indulgent Human or Little Light Rihanna. There's it, it's exciting to see how much it's changed and how much it keeps changing. Oh, love this community. Love this community. <laughs> it was nice meeting you, Riley. I can't wait to. Uh, I can't, I'm gonna. Hop in your uh, Twitch channel and see how you uh, play. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Well, now, oh, now I'm getting a little nervous. You want to <laughs> uh, to to throw out your your Twitch channel for for everyone listening? Sure, guys. Uh, you know what? Just follow me everywhere at Riley Hot Sauce. Twitch, Twitter, Instagram. That, that's where you can find me. Riley Hot Sauce. That's my gamer tag. You can find me on all uh, on both platforms. Battle.net, you play. Find me everywhere. I love you all. I love you all so much. RWG, it's been really cool getting to do another episode of the Truthcast with you again. Uh, really enjoyed it. Yeah, it's been a while. I'm glad uh, we were able to get get one going again. We got to get going on this stuff again. We've taken a lot of time off. We've had some technical issues, but I think we're back on. Hopefully, I hope so. And and hopefully, I'm not sure next if it'll be next week. Um, 
hopefully uh, we're going to have uh, Swain Stash from Crucible Radio on uh, coming up. So that'll be uh, cool to talk a little PvP side uh, there. So, uh, again, Riley, just really cool having you on. And, I, again, I really enjoyed getting to meet you and talk to you uh, out in Seattle. That was that was a cool thing. Um, and uh, you also have one of uh, where I knew you before and I didn't know it is you have one of the greatest tweets of all time, which is your one you have <laughs> to your account. <laughs> and I actually had seen that when you originally tweeted it. And then after I met you and added you on Twitter and I saw that was you, I was like, oh my fucking God. <laughs> That's one of the greatest tweets of all time. Bitch Scott's to know, you know, what can I say? Yeah. yeah <laughs> So yeah, RWG, you'll have to you'll have to look that up. His pin tweet on his profile. It's a it's a clap. Awesome. awesome. I get sassy. I get sassy on Twitter. I get sassy everywhere. So uh, be prepared. Good. I like the sass. <laughs> Good. Welcome. And to everyone that uh, is listening, just appreciate you as always. Um, anyone out there has any interest in joining us and talking destiny reach out to rwg or myself let us know because we'd love to have you on and i just hope everyone has an awesome time an awesome week and uh for those getting to go to guardian con i i hope it's incredible and again look forward to seeing all the experiences there so until next time have a great day that's a wrap mm-hmm.